слова нашого спікера, міністра освіти і науки України Сергія Хліта. Прошу. Доброго дня, шановне тобі. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. The, the mic is not on. Uh, in the latest uh, days, we have been uh, delivering a lot of information on behalf of the ministry, and uh, today I'm ready to sum up the most important information and to answer your question. The most uh, often, the most often asked question uh, is uh, about uh, um, those students and those uh, school children uh, who are temp uh, who are temporary replaced uh, persons from Crimea and from Donbas region. Um, the proportion uh, between uh, uh, between the, these two destinations is huge. From Donbass, we have around 30,000 students and school children, while we have only 1,400 students and school children from Crimea. I would like to assure you that all uh, school children and uh, uh, child and uh, younger children who uh, uh, are, were displaced from Donbass, uh, they went to schools and kindergartens. Um, uh, uh, those uh, uh, children whose parents uh, uh, oh, went back to the areas, uh, for them also the schools were repaired. Uh, those children for whom there were nowhere to go, they were left in the oblasts where they were displaced. And I would like to assure you that all the students who were displaced from their uh, cities, they, are, they also were provided with the full possibility to uh, apply and uh, uh, to apply to other universities. Actually, the procedure is simplified for them, and this is facilitated by the by the government. Uh, so sometimes uh, students do not have all required documents, and uh, in this case, uh, the students are required uh, to uh, present uh, the ID and uh, all the rest information in this case is extracted from the joint register of the students of Ukraine and uh, um, uh, the system which uh, which is applied now is that they are considered to be as uh, um, uh, temporary students that is they are enrolled to the universities just for one term and uh, then the decision will be made the universities um, uh, uh, can re re reject uh, to um, uh, Acquire, to acquire the student only under one um, pretext that the academic group uh, where the students wants to which the student wants to join is more than five people exceeding the limited number of students for this group. And in this case, the university provides uh, an official um, rejection to the student. We look at this rejection, and at the same time, the student advises to the student where to apply on this speciality. Also, we, uh, the delegation of our ministry visited Poland, where we visited two ministries, uh, Ministry of uh, uh, 
uh, Public Education and Minister of Higher Education. Also, we uh, visited the Polish Academy of Sciences. In result of all those meetings, we negotiated the stipends, which are called Erasmus for Ukraine. These are 550 stipends and um, uh, uh, 500 out of them are for bachelor and master's pro, uh, program students, while 50 uh, uh, stipends will be for the postgraduates uh, um, from Donbass regions. And uh, uh, in the nearest future, uh, those selected students will go to uh, study to Poland, and thus. Uh, uh, Donbass natives who currently stay in various universities in uh, around Ukraine in some short period of time, in a week or two, will go to Poland to study. Uh, the next, uh, I would like to mention that uh, this uh, summer we have passed a new law on higher education and uh, tomorrow in Tarashevchenko National University we will start uh, the conference devoted to the implementation of this university where um, uh, we will present and advise and recommend the, uh, the uh, prorectors of the biggest Ukrainian universities how to implement this law properly and uh, the law which is, has to be implemented requires uh, application of some uh, of its provisions immediately. Some of its provisions require special um, uh, bylaws. Some of them require special decrees from the Ministry of Education. Um, all this will be discussed at the tomorrow's conference. The um, second important aspect of our current work is uh, thinking about uh, reform of uh, science organization in Ukraine. And in these terms, uh, our visit to uh, Poland also was very important. We studied the experience in, to, in terms of organizing the uh, research and development work in um, Poland, and uh, we noticed that uh, uh, there is currently a big difference uh, between uh, Ukraine and Poland, uh, and uh, that uh, in Poland, it was much easier to shift um, uh, the science research and development institutions from the Academy of Science system to the university system. Uh, uh, in Ukraine, the portion of scientific research which is done under the umbrella of uh, National Academy is much bigger. The second important uh, aspect uh, is the budget for research and development development and uh, uh, scientific research because when preparing to join the European Union, they considerably uh, restored their uh, laboratories uh, and uh, research equipment. Nevertheless, currently we continue our work on uh, drawing up new uh, piece of legislation devoted to the reform in uh, scientific research sphere. Uh, one more um, uh, draft law in course of uh, uh, reforms is the law on secondary education, where much space will be given to the vocational training. Uh, and uh, to this end, we uh, cooperate uh, very intensively with uh, uh, Germany and the Netherlands. Uh, I believe that the Netherlands today are one of the best countries in terms of the vocational training organization. I should say that the prime minister of the Netherlands, he delivers uh, lectures and training in one of the vocational training institutions in uh, the the Hague and uh, mm, mm, 
they have a huge number of vocational training institutions per capita of population. And the system how vocational training is organized and the structure of this training is uh, very smart and I believe we should um, uh, apply it to Ukraine. Uh, uh, there is a huge number of issues uh, under dispute currently in society and uh, um, we need to uh, think about all those challenges which uh, had accumulated during the previous period of 20 years. We have a huge uh, uh, number of legislative um, issues. We have to optimize the number of schools. We have to optimize the number of teachers and lecturers in all sorts of educational institutions. When we speak to the International Monetary Fund uh, and discuss the workload of teachers and lecturers, we see that there is a huge difference between the approach, even between the approach here in Ukraine and uh, abroad. Uh, in Ukraine, we count only the academic hours which teachers spend at cl in classroom, while abroad they count all uh, hours which uh, uh, teachers and lecturers devote to students. Also, we continue discussion with the broad public and experts. We continue to study international experience and. Uh, after the law on higher education, uh, we will think about the law on secondary education and uh, the law of, uh, on research development. If you have any questions, I will be happy to answer. I'm from Mariupol, <laughs> yes. You once were saying that 7% of teachers cannot be allowed to teach. Is that the whole figure for Ukraine, not just Donetsk and Lugansk regions? And second, if there is a possibility to put uh, these uh, students and children from the East and the schools and universities of Western Ukraine, children from Lviv, from Kapetians, will come to uh, Ukrainian Mariupol, to Novazisk, and people will be happy to welcome them. So that's the proposal and the third one. Now there are scouts organizations, scouting organizations like PLUS, they started to actively uh, organize not just uh, green tourism, but military exercises, training for young people. Are you ready to develop the programs to involve students, uh, uh, school students to such military training? And because uh, 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 maybe ahead of us is return of Crimea and many be other lands of Ukraine. Talking about 7%, we did not calculate it. That was my answer to a journalist because the journalist was trying to ask me how many, how many of such teachers. That's definitely less than 10%. These are my observations when I talk to my colleagues from Donbass, of course. That's about Donbass. And it's about a small number of people who were calling for elimination of Ukrainian statehoodness to violations, uh, to killing of Ukrainians. These people are known. It's not like you have to hunt uh, witches, uh, find them. They were speaking in the media, on their TV channels. 
and they were forcing, they were intimidating people when such referenda were organized. For local communities, these people are known. And they understand who we are talking about, and I believe that's not such a big, uh, such a difficult thing. And I need to say that we have fired three civil servants already because they violated the oath of a civil servant. I am, um, was surprised that these people got uh, jobs uh, in authorities again. That is why we cannot leave these things. And those who were on the side of terrorists should not be communicating with children. When we are talking about uh, placement of our children to other regions, it's not just to Western Ukraine. In Western Ukraine, they feel comfortable, like you can feel comfortable outside of your home. But these are Kiev, Odessa, Kharkov, Kherson. They are welcome everywhere. And uh, we, our ministry has to react to many other issues on a daily basis. We need to be very dynamic. We now are thinking in cooperation with some of our TV channels, uh, which programs of tolerant, tolerance for children we need to suggest in schools, for schools, because now there's a uh, like uh, mm, contacts uh, of different uh, cultures where they lived it was one way where they go it's different way children have to learn how to listen to each other to respect each other to be patient to be tolerant because these are our children they grow up and we need to have uh, big tolerance and the adults are to th remember that and the teachers and for schools for our children will be uh, developing this distance of tolerance that's very important also yesterday we sent the letter it's on the website of the Ministry of Science and Education and that's the letter dedicated to our children who have special needs. We have signals that when they move from Donbass to other regions, first of all, for them, for their parents, it's important to get to have where to live and what to eat. And the third question, the third thing is education, because uh, they have special needs and they do not go anywhere and we pay attention and we draw attention to our civil servants who uh, are responsible for education in the region to pay special attention to these children to involve them into educational process so that they become normal members of schools and kindergartens these are the problems to be addressed and every day and there are some questions which are to be answered immediately. It's important. I mentioned the status of so-called free listener. What does it mean? That means that students from Donbass, when they move to other regions, uh, their money do not go, uh, do not follow them. They just get their stipends because formally we are not closing the uh, institutes or universities which they left. Uh, some teachers uh, failed to leave and uh, or they went somewhere uh, formally. Uh, we do not close these uh, uh, universities and institutes and we hope that they will resume the, their work. But at the same time, we know there are calls from so-called pseudo-governments in Donbass so that educational establishments are to continue working, so that schools continue to work. We are against that. If there are uh, military actions there, children and teachers cannot be concentrated in one place because Bislan tragedy may be repeated, and we are absolutely against it. There should be no uh, education, no process, uh, where the military actions are going on. Some universities moved uh, from Donetsk, from Lugansk to other places where they have their campuses, they organize uh, distance learning. Sometimes they uh, just uh, 
uh, make miracles so that their universities continue working so that they uh, still have all the teachers uh, and so that they can offer the educational services to their students. There's no one answer to everything. Every day we need to react to the challenges that the life puts. Mic microphone. As uh, Shevchenko said, uh, learn somebody else's, but don't forget about yours. We, you, you, we are talking about closing schools for a long time, but maybe where there are fewer teachers, uh, you can teach them better. They can be put all together into one class. Today, everyone says there's no money, there's no money. The authorities, the previous authorities were talking about that, but at that time they were stealing billions. A lot of money could be invested to teach an expert. Have you understood my question? That's first. Second. Why uh, don't you think about young people to go? Where, where should they go? To, to working places? Because elderly people have pensions and uh, salaries. You mean they should go to work as uh, teachers, doctors? Thank you, Father. Uh, the first question, I can say that when I'm talking about optimization of the network of schools, that does not mean just mechanical closing of schools. Our government has the concept of decentralization. Local community will itself look at what they need, what they can maintain, support. If we have to close schools, that sometimes we have more teachers than students or vice versa. There are some students, but in this village, there's just the teacher of uh, physical training, and he teaches uh, physics and biology. And then this child uh, will uh, have no chances to get proper education and to enter the university. But maybe they have some noble prize winner, future Nobel Prize winner there. So we are closing schools which are unable to teach uh, uh, children. We need to remember that there we need to open one high quality school for all these villages. But for that, high quality roads are needed and high quality transportation. And the same is true about uh, hospitals and cultural centers. It's about systemic approach. We are not just that automatically closing certain things because some schools cannot exist. Another important aspect is cultural because the village that has school, it's alive. If the school loses school, there's a threat that the village will disappear. So I would like to emphasize that we are talking about systemic approach to these things. If we reduce number of teachers, we should not be reducing the uh, salary fund. We need to increase salaries to those teachers who work. If we reduce the number of teachers, we need to think about the employment, that social problem. Our approach is systemic. It's not based just on the desire to save money on something. And same way, what you are talking, what you mentioned about young people, it's also not a simple thing. There's a problem. We have many pedagogical institutions, but uh, uh, not more than 20% of graduates uh, continue to work as teachers. If they come to schools, uh, they don't get enough hours. There are many retired teachers who work. But just imagine if there was a school where just graduates work, but not retired people, pensioners, pensioners, they support the quality of the school. 
they maintain the quality of the school. We cannot say that we need to put aside uh, only pension age uh, people or young people. And uh, what's uh, specific in our humanitarian sector, we shouldn't be simplifying the problem and uh, finding only why one way out. The humanitarian problems, they are very comprehensive and they require systemic approach. I'm from Lugansk. Could you please tell? Uh, this is the question which is important not just for me. Can uh, an educational establishment get me employed if I don't have a document about education? But there are some indirect proofs that I have some experience of work and education. You mean because uh, now you lost these documents, you don't have them with me. I don't have them. But uh, all these uh, uh, indirect proofs I do have then come to us, uh, come to the ministry, we'll try to help. And if the educational establishment is subordinate to the Ministry of the Interior, that's okay. It will be, it's easier for the students to design the algorithm if they don't have uh, documents uh, so that they are taken to universities. But with teachers, it's more difficult. But the main thing is with the place of work. I found this place. Then come to the ministry. We'll help you. Thank you. Courier newspaper. But what's the specific mechanism of dismissing these teachers who was uh, supporting separatists? There are plenty of there's plenty of information about such people because they are, uh, uh, people say they don't know how to dismiss them. If it's about school teachers, that is uh, up to local authorities to do that. Myself, personally, as the minister, I sign contracts with rectors. If it's about schools, these are local authorities, but the ministry may have its uh, opinion. If there are such facts, these facts are not uh, left without attention. That's not the main issue now to dismiss someone. The main thing is that the general opinion is that there should be no place for such people in education. The main thing is quality of education reforms. These are things that we are talking about. They are unpleasant, but uh, we need to understand that such people shouldn't be working. If you have the facts, give us to us and we'll work on that. Then the question about reforms and quality. What obstacles? Uh, have you seen uh, on the way uh, to implement the law on higher education? Thank you. As I've mentioned, tomorrow we will be presenting of how the law is to be implemented because it's not just about bylaws, but what software should universities have to be able to uh, implement the law. The main problem is uh, that this is a good law, but that's the instrument which is to be used. If we were fighting for university autonomy starting from 2005, we created a consortium on university autonomy, and there are eight uh, universities in there. We've been working on the text of the law for three years minimum, and we have the result. But now the next step the universities have to use the law to really become autonomous. We are talking about financial, academic, and organizational autonomy. If universities are not active, if academic communities are not demanding to each other in their attitude to the rector, to the uh, ministry, the students are not demanding from uh, professors and professors from the students, then this law will be just good wishes on the paper academic environment should take this into their hands. That's the most important. Everything else will overcome. What are the main problems? Money that was going on. 
and we do the sequester of the budget and the people are fighting and war is uh, task number one. If we are reducing funds for re fundamental research, we need to understand that we give more money to uh, the research uh, uh, in military sector because the country is in war. But what are the reforms without funding? Funding is the problem. And this, another problem is inertia from civil servants. Many do not understand what university autonomy is. Some believe that that's anarchy. Some believe that that's impossible because the state should control everything. The state should control the quality of the final product of graduates and the scientific research. But in everyday life, universities should uh, uh, be responsible for itself. University can do it. The school cannot. The school cannot does not have such uh, capacity. So the state should take more care of the schools. So first is activity of scientific in, uh, in communities, second um, funding, and third inertia. And last question. Ukrainian Crisis Media Center. My question is about money. Uh, the university schools and kindergartens, which are in Donbass and Lugansk regions, in, which do not work. What is the share of that in the total budget? What happens with that? Will some part of that be used for universities or educational establishment? This money are not transferred anywhere. If there's no possibility for teachers to go to work, uh, they still get this money. We do not uh, uh, stop financing the schools and the kindergartens of Donbass. But what about maintaining? What maintaining, just imagine, what maintaining if the school is with broken windows and you cannot get there, it's dangerous. Potentially the money, if some school, some kindergarten is fa fails to be open, if we find out that the building is uh, destroyed, then in such case some money will be transferred. But that's not time for that now. We hope and we saw in the territories that were liberated with what enthusiasm the people are restoring schools, kindergartens, and universities. This enthusiasm is great, and we need to look at how events develop in the front line. Thank you. Thank you.